GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Today we're talking about speaking the word over your circumstances have you ever heard people say, well, that name it and claim it's Christianity, it's wrong. Well, I have to. And what are they talking about? Well, one of the things I've come to realize lately is that people tend to parrot what they've heard somebody else say, and they've never checked it out for themselves. <clears throat> We're going to do that today. Sometimes you just hear people bad-mouthing something, and you think, well, okay, that sounds right. All right, that is really wrong. That name it and claim it stuff is wrong. And instead of learning what it's really about, you kind of toss the baby out with the bathwater, don't you? Well, where did all this speaking the word over your circumstances, name it and claim it, come from? It started primarily back in the 1980s with Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin. And they taught something nobody had ever heard before. That's in the Word, but it had never been taught with revelation knowledge about it. These two men have great integrity. Kenneth Hagin's died, but they're both known, not only by people on the outside, but by people on the inside, as people of great integrity. And they had been taught by God in their own personal lives to speak the Word, to know what God's Word said about something. In Kenneth Hagin's life, it was healing. In Kenneth Copeland's life, it was finances. And to speak it out loud over their circumstances until the thing they needed to happen actually happened. Now, how did it get out of context? Well, it came to be called prosperity teaching. And people would say, well, that's only in America because America is so materialistic. That's all they think about is greed, get more and more and more. Doesn't work the rest of the world. That's not really true. Now, America can have a problem with that, and I'll agree with that. And I will also agree with you that the rest of the world is hurting financially in ways that America can't even understand. But everywhere I go, I meet people who say, we want a baby. And we've had trouble having a baby. But we read in the Bible that God opens wombs and God can give people babies. And so we're believing God for a baby. And we thank God for our baby. One lady came to me one time and she said, I just hate to go to family reunions because everybody's there with their babies. And they're saying to me, when are you going to have a baby? She said, I would have had a baby if I could have had a baby by now. And I said, well... You know, God can open your womb, and we're going to pray. She said, okay. She's had four children. So it works. Don't ever let anybody tell you that it's wrong to name something and claim something. What we're going to talk about today, though, are the errors in it and then what's correct about it. Because God wants you to prosper. He wants to take care of you. One of the problems people make is they'll pray and say, if it be thy will, Lord. And God, I know, would like to say, get out your Bible and find out what my will says. This is my will. What does my will say about your finances, about your marriage, about your children, about your hopes, your dreams, what your battles? What does it say? Know what my word says and stand on that and believe I'll do it for you. So it has been around a long time. You know what they used to call it? Standing on the promises. I, I grew up singing that song, standing on the promises of God. I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God that cannot fail. So it's been around a long time. It's just that someone got a revelation of it, and took off with it. And it, boy, it really blessed our lives. My husband and I had our lives changed by it. Did we make mistakes in it? Yes, we did. And I want to talk about that, because I want to share 
some of the mistakes I made, and maybe it'll help you. But it's just like the devil to take a good thing and run it in the ground the wrong way. In fact, people can do it. My husband says <clears throat> that anytime you get a new truth that you're learning about with God, maybe you're over here and you didn't believe in it at all, then you hear about it, you get excited about it, you go way over here and you're still out of balance. And then like a, a pendulum, God brings it back and you're right there in the middle believing what you really need to believe. And that's the way it is with this. You see, God wants you to learn His Word. He wants you to know His Word. He says, those are the words of life. They have life in them. They have miracles in them. This is not an ordinary book. One time when I first started going to Belarus and they had just come out from under communism, my interpreter said, Betty, when I was a little boy, nobody could have a Bible. They were forbidden. I didn't even know what a Bible was, Betty. Never heard one, never seen one. And he said, in my village, somebody said, there's an old lady, and she's got this magic book, and she's got it hidden where nobody knows where it is, but I know where it is. And they said, a magic book? Well, we want to go see it. He says, okay. When she's gone, we're going to go in her house, and we're going to go look at that book. So the lady was gone, and these kids went in this house. The boy knew, that knew where it was, opened it up, and it was a Bible. That's what it was. The magic book was a Bible. Now, if it's wrong to stand out too much, to swing too far on the pendulum, where is that? What is that talking about where it, a beneficial teaching gets taken way too far? Well, some people call it Cadillac faith. God's going to give me a Cadillac. God's going to give me a big this. God's going to give me a big that. Well, God wants you to prosper. It's in the Bible. So many of the people in the Bible were very wealthy, weren't they? Abraham was. Joseph was. Daniel was. Isaiah was. Isaac was. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. And God wants you to do well. But this other is where you just decide you've got to have all this material thing, have all of these material things in order to be somebody and to have worth and value and to impress people. And that's just not God. God says, I don't want you caught up in that. It's, it'll, it'll kill you. It looks good and it's not good. I want you to be caught up in me and get your worth and your value from me. I want to do great things with you. I remember one time hearing Pastor Cho, who is, uh, has one of the biggest churches in the world in South Korea, and I, heard, I read his book. Talking, it's called The Fourth Dimension. He was talking about all of this, and he said when he first learned about it, he needed a bicycle. And he gets searched the word. God wanted you to have things. He wanted a bicycle. He needed a bicycle. And, and so he would tell people, I'm pregnant with a bicycle. And they'd say, what? He'd say, I'm pregnant with a bicycle. I've just got this Bible inside, this bicycle inside of me. And I believe God's going to give me one. I need one in my ministry. I need one to do what God needs me to do. And I just am pregnant with this Bible bicycle. And uh, sure enough, the day came. It happened. You see, God wants to do great things for you. He wants to prove his love to you. He wants to prove his faithfulness to you. He wants his glory to be talked about, all that's been done. Why does God want to get all the glory? Have you ever asked yourself that? He isn't like a human that says, I want all the glory. He's not like that. He wants all the glory. So that then when other people hear the stories, they'll go, there really is a God. And he really does care about people. He really does care about me. Maybe he'll help me. And that's why he does it. Look at this first scripture. This is what God wants for you. 3 John 1, 1 to 2. And this is John writing it to his good friend Gaius. 
how truly I love you. We're the best of friends. And I pray for good fortune in everything you do and for your good health, that your everyday affairs prosper as well as your soul. Now, that's the key in that verse, even as your soul prospers. Because you see, if God dumped all of these Cadillacs on you and all these material things, but your soul wasn't prospering, you would end up unhappy. Look at all the people that have everything in the world. There's someone watching right now. You're very wealthy. You could name it, and it could be in your hands in a matter of minutes. You could have anything you wanted, and you're not happy. And you've been just turning the TV channels, and here's this lady talking, and all of a sudden she's talking to you. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, God wants your soul to prosper. You've got to learn how to do that. And God wants to teach you how to let your soul prosper. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotions. God wants to come in and take over. And when he does, he, he prospers your soul. He prospers your mind. He prospers your will. He prospers your emotions. That's what you've been missing. You thought you had everything and you got it and it wasn't anything. You still felt empty. Well, God wants to teach you how to let your soul prosper. You know, God is like any good parent. If you're a good parent, don't you want good things for your children? Don't you want to give them their heart's desire? Oh, my goodness. As a parent, You'll do anything to get your kids what they want as long as their heart's right about it. You'll make sacrifices. You'll go to any length to give them. You'll even sacrifice something that's important to you. God did that with Jesus. He sacrificed his son in order to give you salvation and the abundant life on this earth. So God wants to give you things. He wants to give you mental good things, mental health, uh, new ideas, creative things going on in your life. God wants to prosper you. God wants to bless you. His Word says that. I just got through reading you that. The Bible is full of promises that God wants for us. You could even take a yellow marker Start in Genesis, go all the way to Revelation, and just highlight the promises that jump out at you. You would be really surprised how much God wants to do for you. It covers every area of your life so that you don't come short in anything. You just are a blessed person. So remember, this thing of name it, claim it, speak the word, standing on the promises, it's the same now as it's always been. It's not any different. Well, what happened then? Because it did get taken to extreme. There were bad things that happened. People did turn sour. What, what went wrong? Well, one thing is people, without realizing it in the beginning, began to think it was their faith that made everything happen. And without realizing it, they got their eyes on their faith and off of God. And they thought when it didn't happen, their faith wasn't strong enough. Maybe their child died or some business failed because their faith wasn't strong enough. But that's not true. You know, God in uh, either First or Second Peter talks about the things to add to your Christian life. And faith's in there, but then there's some things you add above that, after that. And so it even says, and add to your faith. So faith's not the end all and be all. It's just part of the Christian life. It's a huge part, but it's not all. And I, I want to tell you, those of you that stood in faith and believed so hard, and then it didn't happen, and you had a faith collapse, I want to encourage you today, and I want to tell you, I've had them too. Had them where they just knocked me out. One time, 
learning all of this, eager to learn it, eager to know Jesus, not eager to be materialistic and greedy and grabby, e eager to learn what Jesus was teaching me. One time I was so sure that a thing, an achievement that we wanted to reach was going to happen. I was so sure. I told everybody it's going to happen. And it didn't happen. And you talk about a faith collapse. I couldn't read the Bible. I couldn't pray. I mean, I was just dead. And it was like, well, what's the point of all of that? That doesn't work. But Jesus is so faithful to us. The Bible says, even when we are so weak that we don't have any faith left, He remains faithful to us. And the Lord began calling me back and saying, Betty, I'm your Lord. I'm your Savior. I died for you. I love you. Come on back. Come on back, Betty. And slowly but surely, I came back. And I came back stronger than ever. And you will too. Don't stay there in that deadness. Don't stay there. Get up and fight. Fight for your faith. Be a faith fighter. Just get going again. Well, did I ever happen to have it happen again? Oh, yes. I do not want to be one of these people that gets on TV and tells you that, boy, I've done it right. I never messed up. Oh, I've made so many mistakes, but I've always gotten up. I've stumbled forward instead of stumbling backwards. So what, what's another thing that happened? Well, one time I wanted to go on this thing called the Rama trip. And you could only go on this trip if you earned enough points to go on it in a business we were in. I wanted to go on it. Our best friends were going on it. And they had done the work and they had earned the right to go. And I wanted to go. Well, we hadn't done the work. I mean, we had tried really hard, but it hadn't worked. But I thought, no. Bible says Abraham believed when there was no reason to believe. And I'm going to believe. Oh, I just, and I sat by the phone on the day. Now, this sounds stupid, but I did it. Sat by the phone on the day that the trip was to leave. I was so sure they were going to call and say, Betty, a mistake's been made. You and Bill get to go. Can you get ready? I go, you bet. We'll be there. Well, nothing happened. The boat left without us. Oh, boy, I was so down. And I had been watching one of these faith preachers or listening to him on the radio, actually. So I thought, I'm going to go see that guy. I'm going to find out what happened. So I went to see him. I said, I listen to you on the radio all the time. And um, I don't know what I did wrong. I believed. I believed with all my heart. He said, well, did you do the work? Well, no. He said, well, you have to do the work, too. And I sat there. And I didn't say it, but in my head, I thought, well, any idiot knows that. I know that. But it was like God was saying, Betty, you're trying to be too spiritual. There is common sense, too. You had to have done the work. But I want to tell you how God redeemed that. Because I don't want you to think, oh, you mean you make mistakes like that and you feel foolish? And it's over? I want to tell you what. Sometimes in the thing that goes wrong that you're trying so hard to do right, those are seeds. And maybe the seed did not sprout that time. But I worked so hard trying to do it the way I thought it was the Lord's way. And it was the Lord that I sowed really good seeds of speaking the word, standing in faith, holding on, leaning on God, leaning into God, pressing into God. And I didn't even realize it. But those were seeds. And, and for years after that, other situations came along that I knew how to stand in faith. I had trained myself in doing it. And I saw other situations happen that I personally do not believe they would have happened if I had not been trained. You see, there's a verse in the Bible that says... The Word tried him until the Word of God came true. Now, that's in Psalms. Well, what would be an example of that? An example of that would be 
God spoke a word to you, and you know God did, but it doesn't ever seem to happen. But you know God did. You've even gone back to God and said, Lord, did you say that to me? Did you really say that to me? And he convinces you again, yes, I did. But until it happens, and you're holding on to that word, and you're speaking that word into the atmosphere, you know it tries you hard. It, it, it's, it takes faith to hold on. You, you have to say, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And that's what that verse means. So was I a fool? No. How are you going to learn how to walk on the water if you don't ever get out of the boat? You know, Peter got out of the boat, and he sunk, but he walked on water first. The rest of those people stayed in the boat. They never had that experience. So God knows that you're going to make some mistakes when you really try to walk by faith and not by sight. As the Bible says, you're going to make some mistakes. I'm telling you now. I've done it. I'm sure I'll do it in the future. Because we all want that faith walk. We all want to see the miracles of God. We all want to stand on the Word, standing on His promises. So, what are some of the ways that God does want us to use it? You ready? One is to look around at your life, what's going on that you don't know how to solve, or you know something needs to change, a change needs to occur, and say, God, show me in your word what to stand on. And you may have to ask somebody. You may not know the Bible well enough, but it could be for any area of your Bible. It could be for your health. It could be for your family, your ministry, your finances, fighting the devil, helping someone else, standing in faith for someone else. But you have to know what the Word of God says. Then you have to learn how to fight the good fight of faith, which means when that all comes against you, and it will, and it primarily comes against you in your mind. You know, the greatest battle's right in here, isn't it? You can fight that one and win that one. You can win any battle. So you have to learn, even when it's hard to do it. Well, what about healing? Because that's probably one people really want to know about. Well, look at this second scripture, Isaiah 53, 5. It's talking about Jesus. In the Old Testament, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It can be an emotional healing. Maybe you have emotional hurts that are so deep. You need emotional healing. You can say, by your stripes, I'm healed. Lord, heal my emotions. And I know this is true because even in the New Testament, Peter refers to that verse. 1 Peter 2, 24. This is the, the third scripture to look at. Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. How about if you've got a problem in your family, in your marriage? How about if you want to have really good kids, and maybe your little children are three and four years old, maybe six or seven years old, but you want godly children? What's a good verse to go by? Isaiah 54, because it, it talks in there about great shall be the peace of your children. Actually, there's things all through Isaiah 54 that are really good to stand on. If you are a woman that's been scorned, you can read there what God says about it. In your despair, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be with you. If you're someone that people have lied about and it wasn't the truth, or maybe you made a big mistake and you were wrong, but you don't want to live that way, then there's a verse in there that says, No weapon formed against you will, will prosper, but every tongue that rises against you, against you in condemnation, you will condemn. How? By your godly life. You made a mistake, you repented, you did what you could to make it right, and you went on. And with your godly life, God showed everybody, see, 
They're mine. But look at this fourth scripture about your family in Malachi 2.15. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? Yes. In body and spirit, you're His. What does He want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. May, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. You want a good marriage to last a long, long time? Then guard your heart and speak that word, Lord. My heart is guarded and I am loyal to the wife of my youth and my children are godly. I have children that serve you, Lord. They love you and your word says I can. Same with your money. Tithe. Read Malachi 3.10. He talks about, you give to me tithes and offerings. I'll pour out a blessing so big you can't handle it. I've seen that happen in our life over and over. God is not a man that he should lie. If he says he'll do that, he will do it. And you say, well, didn't happen. Well, hadn't happened yet. Maybe there's a day coming down the road that it's the exact time and if it came before that, it would be too soon, and you would squander or lose it. Who knows what? Make a wise investment. But just know this. God wants you to speak His Word out loud for your situation. Bye. Hello, I'm Betty Swan with Betty Swan Ministries and Pennies from Heaven. Once again, folks, I just have to congratulate you. You are doing an incredible job in my eyes. Can you imagine Pennies from Heaven, which started with $3.44, is now approaching $75,000, all because people care about feeding hungry people with pennies and small change. So tell your friends, tell everyone you know, and take your money to Wells Fargo Bank to the account of Pennies from Heaven, Betty Swan Ministries, and then 100% of what you donate will go for food. So to God be the glory. You know, God can use anything, even pennies, and even you and me. So God bless you and thank you. Order your copy today from the GLC Bookstore by calling the number on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering. 